Let's look at three World War I era swords that all tell a story of their own and tell us something about how swords were viewed even at the beginning of the 20th century around World War I. Hi folks, I'm Matt Easton of Scholar Gladiator and Eastern Antique Arms. Now, um, as you know, I'm a dealer in antique swords and other weapons, and so a lot of things come through my hands, and it just so happens that there are three very interesting World War One era swords with me at the moment, um, that all in due course will be going up on the website. Um, I've got quite a lot of stock and I filter through stuff as I can, but they all tell an interesting story about World War I. So the main theme that I want to focus on here, and there are many uh, sort of avenues I could go down, but the main theme is that even in World War I, and despite World War I, and even after World War I, swords were still considered by some people, maybe not everyone, but by some people, they were still considered as serious military weapons. Now, going into World War I, we all know, hopefully, uh, that there were lots of misconceptions about how the war was going to pan out. People didn't know it's going to end up with tanks and aeroplanes and things like this. But they went into it on one hand with things like dreadnoughts. Um, Britain and uh, Germany had these massive uh, warships. But on the other hand, every major power that went into World War I went into it with cavalry um, being a major component of their armed forces. And yes, cavalry did have rifles and carbines, but they also had swords. And every military that went into World War I, including the USA, went into it with swords. Britain had just developed the 1908. The French uh, were using a few different models, um, but the 1896 was the most modern one. The uh, Prussians were using the 1889 uh, model, and the Americans had just developed the pattern 1913, just a year before World War I broke out. So all of them went in with relatively new models of sword, most of them thrusting swords, although if we look at Eastern Europe, we see certain curved swords and still a big use on the sabre uh, there. But all of the main militaries, whether it's the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Russians, uh, the British and the French, the Italians, whoever, they all went into the war using using swords and expecting to use swords. And as we know, they didn't use swords as much as they expected, but in some cases swords were used. Now, these three swords here all tell a little bit of a story um, by themselves. Now, firstly, this here is a Royal Navy officer's sword. As it happens, it was owned by a Vice Admiral, very high ranking, but he was a Vice Admiral much later on. We're talking about uh, by the 1930s. He actually served in World War I. Uh, he won the Great War, Great War Medal, but he was a junior officer. So in World War I, he was a junior officer. And in around 1920, so a couple of years after the end of World War I, he bought this sword. Now, why is that important? Well, because it's a Wilkinson, and it's what I refer to as a non-regulation or special order Wilkinson sword. It's a fighting sword. So he didn't just buy the regulation model. He didn't go, just go for the standard one. He bought this specific one. Now, this one um, has a standard blade on it, but what's really characteristic about it is, for those of you who know these swords well, will notice it has what's called a solid guard. Okay, that is, it has no folding section on the inside here. Now, Royal Navy swords usually have a folding section down here, known as a drop, which comes down and engages with a lug or peg on the side, and there's a hole in the guard that engages with it. And that locks it into the sword. Because, of course, naval officers are constantly getting into and out of boats, climbing up ladders, this kind of stuff. Um, so climbing around internally in the ship and on the deck of the ship. And sometimes, in fact, very often, they're carrying their sword rather than wearing, wearing it, which is a Royal Navy tradition. Um, and that means that they want a sword that if you turn it upside down, it doesn't drop into the sea or drop down a deck onto someone's head who's below. So quite simply, you want the sword to be sort of locked into the scabbard. Now, because they've done away with that guard, that folding guard section, why did they do that? Because this is a stronger guard. This was originally designed in the Victorian era. Although this sword dates to 1920, this exact model of sword was available to officers in the 1870s and 1880s as a fighting weapon, because this guard was seen as superior. It's more like the cutlass guard of the fighting sword. And you'll notice they still wanted a locking mechanism, so they put the locking mechanism in the back there, the little lug there, and if I push that in, it disengages from the scabbard and I can now draw the sword out. Now, it might not be apparent to those of you watching on the screen, but this is also sturdier. This is thicker, heavier, um, and a little bit wider than some of the ones in common usage at the time. So this is a fighting weapon. This would have been approximately 50 to 100% more expensive than a standard officer's sword. So having served as a junior officer in World War I, 
He came out, uh, he'd moved up a rank or two, I think, by that point, and he bought himself this with his extra pay, um, an extra fancy fighting weapon. Isn't that interesting? I think it's interesting that someone serving in World War I, fighting in uh, massive uh, battleships, actually still thought, well, I want a really good fighting sword. You've got to bear in mind as well that in 1920, while many of you will think of the Western Front and you'll think of World War I in those terms, the British Royal Navy was spread around the globe. They were policing waters. They were literally fighting piracy. They were uh, gunboat diplomacy as well. So there were things happening in uh, off the coast of India and China, you know, Hong Kong, all the way out to Canada and the Americas, right, right the way down into South America. So the Royal Navy actually played an incredibly diverse role all over the world. And sometimes they had boarding parties who actually functioned on land as well, most famously perhaps in the Indian Mutiny and also in the Sudan campaign in the 1880s. So sometimes they fought on land. And in fact, there were Royal Navy officers in the 1880s who literally used their swords against dervishes in the desert, nowhere near the sea. Um, so they did still see uh, a purpose for the fighting sword, at least in the 1880s. Uh, although it was rare, it did happen, and even, it seems, some people were still buying these swords after World War I. Um, because, as I say, as a Royal Navy officer, you could find yourself anywhere across the globe doing any sort of thing. You might be in a jungle, you might be in a desert, or you might be uh, fighting pirates at sea. Uh, well, by piracy, I mean, you know, like smugglers and stuff like that, and boarding uh, boats where there might be hostile uh, people on board. Right, so next sword. So, this one is very interesting initially. I won't go into the huge detail for the non-sword massive geeks like me, uh, but it has a chequered pommel and it doesn't have royal artillery marked on the blade. So my, my initial assumption was this was a light cavalry sword. Now, strictly speaking, this has a fully flattened chequered uh, check backstrap, which dates it to 1895 or afterwards. And it does actually have a VR mark on the blade. So it's Victorian. However, um, it's a, made by Pillin, incidentally. It's not a numbered Wilkinson, it's a numbered Pillin, but we don't have the records for Pillin. But luckily for me, it has the name on the side. And the name identifies it to a certain Douglas Stewart. And there was only one D. Stewart who could have possibly bought this sword when he did and was in the army. And he was actually in the artillery. He was in the Royal Garrison Artillery. But one of his early posts when he was a lieutenant, so he would have been a second lieutenant or a lieutenant when he bought this, was um, actually based in West Africa. Um, so he was with a West Africa, um, essentially, artillery force at the time. So he obviously thought that he wanted a proper sword. He was serving in the far reaches of the empire, um, despite the fact that he was in the artillery. And he bought what's essentially a light cavalry sword. Now, this is technically the same model of sword as the artillery used, but usually artillery ones have a stepped pommel rather than a shekin pommel. And usually they say Royal Artillery on the blade. This one doesn't, uh, but it says VR um, and it's got his name on it. So I know whose it was. So um, now you might think, okay, that's interesting. He bought a sword, so what, Matt? Well, the thing to note is this has been really well service sharpened uh, all the way from there upwards and the full sedged around the back here. So whether he served sharpened this when he was going into West African service or when he, whether he sharpened it because he was later in World War I. Um, and in fact, he is, interestingly, he is listed, here's the clash of technologies. So bear in mind, this is a guy who bought a sword in about 1899, I think, which I think is when he commissioned, if I remember correctly. So in the last couple of years of Victoria's reign, he bought a sword, let's say in 1899, marked to Queen Victoria. He had it service sharpened for active service, either in West Africa or World War I. But check this out. He is listed in the, um, in the New Year's Honours list of 1919, so the year after the First World War ended. And he is listed as being given the Royal um, Air Force Medal. Um, the Royal, Royal, but not the Flying Corps, it was actually the RAF by that point, I think. So he was an airman. Like, what the hell? How did he go from artillery man, like buying a decent sword and service sharpening it, to finishing the First World War flying airplanes? Well, quite simply, in the British Army, in the British military, a lot of the earliest flyers of, of planes came from the artillery because they were originally used for spotting artillery. So when your guns were shooting, 
someone, always an officer, and they were always officers, and one of the officers would say, I'll go up in the plane and I'll tell you whether you need, need, need to move the shots a bit to the left, a bit to the right, or a bit further, whatever. So a lot of the early flyers came from the officers of the Royal Artillery. And here's an example. So there we go, 1919, and he's being awarded as a flyer, someone who flew aeroplanes in World War I. But he went into World War I with a service sharpened sword expecting to use it. Right, and the final example I've got here. So when I originally purchased this, I thought this was a rather boring and unexciting Royal Artillery sword again. Um, uh, but it had a plain blade, which is a bit odd. Um, there were also some other oddities about it. For example, again, for the real sword aficionados, you'll notice it has a checkered pommel and it has a pommel nut there. Usually those two things don't go in conjunction. Usually if you've got a checkered pommel, it has a recessed nut at the end here. So um, anyway, for whatever reason, that's got a nut at the end and it's got a checkered pommel, which would usually indicate cavalry rather than Royal Artillery, but we've just seen an example there where there's a checkered pommel for an artillery officer. So it, nothing's certain. Now, this is only a regulation sword. Uh, in the, So I should mention, so I thought this was a basic, plain bladed, fairly uninteresting Royal Artillery sword. When I took it out of its scabbard, three things hit me. Number one, it's beefy, okay? <laughs> Number two, it's really well service sharpened from there upwards and round the tip and round the back. Like really well service sharpened and almost still sharp. Really, really good. The third thing was I didn't realise at all. I flipped the blade over and look what we've got here. That is a recessed proof slug, but it's not any proof slug. It's a hexagonal one with an HW inside, which stands for... Henry Wilkinson. So this is a Wilkinson and indeed flipping it around we've got on the little back there, just get the camera to focus, there we go, you've got down there you've got the serial number. So this is a numbered Wilkinson but with a plain blade, like completely plain, it doesn't have Wilkinson's name on it, it has nothing at all, it's plain from base to tip which is really unusual. So this is ordered presumably either as a to save some money don't put any etching on it or possibly just as a fighting sword and it's been seriously surface sharpened but moreover because we've got the serial number on the back there we can we do have access to the records the Wilkinson records survive they survive in the Royal Armouries or through um, Richard Milner at um, uh, Wilkinson Sword Research um, Arms Research so I looked up that uh, record and unfortunately the name is blank. There's no name recorded, so I'll never know who owned this sword. But nevertheless, it was made in the war years. So this was made around 1915, I think. So this is a World War I period sword. So someone in World War I is ordering what's essentially a really beefy cavalry sword and sharpening up really, really well, even in the age of early tanks and planes and stuff like this being used and dreadnoughts being used in war. So there we go. The conclusion here is there's three stories. They each tell, there's three swords, sorry. They each tell different stories, but they all tell different stories, but also some of the same story. And that is that before, during, and after World War I, some people still considered swords as serious, important fighting weapons, might be a last ditch, might be just personal defence weapon, but something that was worth investing money in, buying the best one, and really well sharpening it, even up until the 1920s. And in fact, if we actually look at the history, if we look at the 1920s and the 1930s, if we look at, for example, the Northwest Frontier, we look at India, we look at um, Afghanistan, there were still military actions going on where swords were involved. And anyone who knows about Indian partition will know that swords were used an awful lot, even in the 1940s in India as well. So there we go, three World War I swords, that might seem late in the history of swords, but they still tell us something really interesting about the history of swords. Thanks for watching. Um, give me a like. Um, if you're not subscribed, please do so. It makes a big difference to the channel. Uh, share the video around, and I hope I'll see you back on here really soon. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.